Alrighty. G'day guys and welcome back to another episode of the Bradley J Driver Experience. You've heard it before, I'll say it again, the future number one podcast in the world. That's right, Joe Rogan, we're putting you on notice, brother. I've sent you messages, I told you we're on the up, we're on the move and we're coming for you. And this is just another step in that direction with another massive episode. Today's guest is an incredible human being with another incredible story. And I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. But first, I just want to say thank you so much. Whether this be the first or one of many that you're tuning into, your support means the world to us. It keeps this show alive and thriving. And you can continue to show your support by hitting the all-important follow or subscribe button, leaving that five-star rating and a raving review on Apple Podcasts app. We love to see it. And it's what continues to push this in front of a new audience week by week. It's what continues to get more people tuning into the show, hearing these stories and being inspired to take action in their lives. And that's what today's episode will do. This story is incredible. I've told it to a few people in conversation over dinners, over coffees, people who have come into my life from you know, past and similar careers and on similar journeys and on similar trajectories to what this guy is trying to achieve. We've known each other for a little while and it started down in Melbourne. I remember the first moment vividly and we'll get into all of that, but this is a story of, I guess, rise and conquer, rise and conquer, but this continuous push in a crazy work ethic, but it was all about getting those stepping stones in order to head to where he is now to set up his business, an international football agency in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome my very good mate, Ryan Fisher. Hey mate, nice to see you. Always good to see you. We just um, had a little chat, a little catch up pre-episode, plenty of good laughs as always. But mate, it's great yeah. to have you here. I've been loving watching the journey and you know, it's crazy. It seems like a lifetime ago that we're down in Melbourne working together and that's where i guess for me i really got an insight to who you are as a human being and the way that you do business which is incredible and i want to share all of that today but so much has happened you're in the uk at the moment you're based in liverpool right yeah and you've got this incredible agency that's in its very early days but doing so well thus far it's been really exciting to see because it's a world that for so many is at arm's reach, I guess, for, for me to be able to see it and hear about it and hear about your journey has been really exciting. But I want to cast back to really early days. Tell us where this passion firstly began for football and yeah. we'll talk a little bit about your first transitions into the business world. Sure. Um, thanks for having me, mate. It's, it's good to see you, like I said before. Um, congratulations on what you're doing here. I think it's a good, a good platform for you. So, um, Appreciate it. I've got no doubt it will go on to do really well. But um, football, I, I was born in England. So my dad's from a place in Liverpool called Old Swan, which, you know, I've got no hesitation in saying um, is one of the, I guess, I wouldn't say poorer, but, you know, one of the harder places in Liverpool to potentially grow up. Um, but it's filled with some really great people, a real good sense of community. So, um, I'm not writing the place off, but it, it's definitely a harder place to grow up. And one of the common languages that you, you're sort of born into in England in general, but especially in little communities like that in Liverpool and your Manchesters and places like that is football. Um, you're born, you're given a team and that's it. There's, you, you don't argue with the team you're given. It usually comes from your dad, your granddad. Um, and I know that in Australia, the AFL is probably quite similar uh, or maybe rugby league, but in England, there's only one one language, one sport, and that, that is football. So my dad was born in Liverpool. He, he's a red. Um, so it was just basically common sense that when I was born and uh, introduced to the world, that that was the that was the team that I was given. So that was the first sort of step, I suppose. And then um, I played. So I grew up in England for the first 10, 11 years of my life. So like every young lad, you dream of running out in front of 90,000 people for Liverpool. That's what's burnt into your brain. School is of no importance. You just go because that's what you do. But I still remember waking up, I'd walk to the school bus with my ball. I'd have a ball on the bus. I'd get off the bus with a ball. I'd have my ball in my bag with my lunch all day. At lunch, it would come out. After school, the ball was back out. You basically lived with a ball. But every kid did. So there was literally 50 balls wherever you went. 
and everyone wanted to use theirs. Do you know what I mean? So it's just from a very young age, it's it's very visual football. Definitely. Growing up in England, very very visual. Um, and then at the age of ten, um, I was playing for a, a, a team called Bridgewater Wolves. Um, I was a defender. I was a sweeper. Um, which for people that don't know is, is a defender, but basically central defender. I was a very tall, lanky, skinny kid. Technically with the ball, I was absolutely atrocious. My dad actually said to me, um, the proudest day of my life was watching you run out to play football. He said, but the worst day of my life was when you got the ball. <laughs> <laughs> he just said, I knew at that point, mate, it just it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, that was quite a, a stark review to get from your old man at such a young age. But um, at the age of 10, I was playing, you know, that's still my ambition. But me and my sister came home from school. My mum and dad sat us down and said, we're moving to Australia and we're leaving in, I think it was four weeks. <clears throat> so obviously that's a big shock to the system. Um, we then immigrate to Australia. I turn up, I'm this tall, skinny English kid covered in spots, funny voice. I've got my AstroTurf football boots on for school shoes. I've got my ball. I turn up to school first day and I'm like, nah, this, this ain't right. Yeah. <laughs> so from the age of sort of 10 to 15, I gradually just managed to fall out of the system because in Australia, football is completely different. The system just is not the same. The love of the game is not the same. The ambition to make it within the sport as a kid just isn't the same. So as you know, growing up in Australia yourself, it's, it's your rugby's, it's your crickets, it's, it's yeah, your tennis, it's, it's everything but, but football. So the love of the game came like every other English kid, really, being born into that community, being given a team, being told that that's you know, something you should aim for. And I just remember always having fun with the ball. Love talking about it, love playing it. Um, but then, like I said, when we got to Australia, that was basically just then taken away. So from the age of sort of... From the age of 15 till maybe three years ago, I've had no involvement, involvement in football at all. But my love of the game, just for some reason, was deeply ingrained within me. And I just felt like I had unfinished business because, I mean, we'll get into it, but when I do something, I want to become the best at it. So even at that young age, I thought, well, if I'm going to play football, I want to become a professional footballer. Definitely. So I almost felt like, in a way, by moving to Australia, that opportunity was then gone. So... I look back at it now and I think I carried with me this desire to, to one day get back into the sport. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, I had no idea how I was going to do it, but um, I've just always loved it. I've absolutely always, always loved it. One um, thing but like I, I said, said, sorry, one thing I love you said there is you said, whatever you do, you've always got this burning desire to be the best at it. And that's yeah. definitely something I've been able to see from the outside looking in. And I, I can tell that that is truly something within your makeup. And it's kind of been the, I guess it's been the, the direction of every career you've taken. Everything yeah. you've done, there's this burning desire and this incredible work ethic. And you know, we, we use that word work ethic a lot. I think it's very lightly used when I think about you and, you know, we had chats about it. I got to see it firsthand. It's, it's another yeah. dimension. It's incredible. Well, work, to, work ethic was the first thing about myself that I liked. Yeah. Um, and when do you notice that? Like, when's the first time that you realise? I still remember the day, mate. I literally remember the exact moment. Um, so, like I said, when we got to Australia, I really struggled. And my sister took to it like a duck to water. So, I turned up at school. I didn't fit in. Academically, um, the work was easy. Socially, I struggled a lot. So for me, there was nothing to cling on to at school that I had any enjoyment with. Um, I was the weird English kid. You know, I just, I, I really struggled to make friends. Uh, I don't know if you remember Magic Cards. <clears throat> nah. Mate, there's a reason why, mate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it was like the poor man's Pokemon card. Okay. Um, you know, like... And basically, I got to school. Everyone's playing cricket, rugby, golf. There was golf at the school I was at, weirdly. I mean, I thought yeah. that was maybe normal. But as I got older, I realized there weren't many schools doing that. But the one I was at did. Um, and I reverted into my shell. So I became very, very isolated. I, I had these magic cards. And I would sit in the elevator shaft at school with two or three other lads that basically didn't even speak. And we just basically trade cards. And that was my social life. Yeah. Um, academically, like I said, um, Academically, like I said, um, I found school quite easy. Yep. 
So I needed, I didn't know this at the time, but I think I was searching for somewhere to be a little bit more creative and sort of implement my personality. And it wasn't school. Yeah. Got a job at McDonald's. And to answer your question, I walked in to this, to this restaurant, the back, I got my uniform, I was given a badge, I was given a hat. And I was very lucky, the manager I had, and I know it sounds silly because it's McDonald's, but I've got a lot, a lot to thank this guy for. His name was Luca. He turned to me and said, if you're late, I'll send you home. If your uniform's not clean, it's not ironed, right? I'll send you home. He goes, if you want any extra shifts, if you work hard, I'll give them to you. There's basically a system in place where you can get promoted, you can become a crew trainer, then you can go into management. And all of a sudden, I just felt like, bang. And this is... Can I interject there? Do you feel like because for you, there wasn't really anything else at this point in time for you? Nothing. I had nothing. You cling to this? It's it become so impressionable? Correct. It was, like I said, it was like something went off in my head and it just all made sense. I was like, you know what? This is a bit of me. He hadn't even mentioned that you get paid at the end of the week. It wasn't a money-driven thing. It was more a case of, okay, I'm only going to be judged here based on my ability. I'm only going to be judged here based on my work and the standard I work to. There's no politics. There's no social scale. There's no, you know, are you the cool kid? Are you the new kid? Are you the weird kid? Are you like the muscliest kid? Are you the best looking kid at school? Are you the most popular? None of that. That whole democracy system that you get at school was gone. Yeah. And I knew there and then I was like, okay, I'm judged here on my ability to get a job done. So basically I found a place that I was allowed to be a lot more creative within my personality, demonstrate sort of my skill set, shall we say. And I just became obsessed with it. And after two or three weeks, I went to him, I said, listen, I want more ships, basically. Yeah. Um, and I used McDonald's as a platform where I was basically working. I'd basically tell my parents that I was going to school. I was telling McDonald's that I didn't have school. Okay. okay? I'd get up in the morning, I'd get on the school bus. I'd get off two stops up the road. I'd walk to McDonald's, I'd work all day. I'd then pick up a night shift, work, go home. Mum and dad thought I'd been at school when really I'd been at McDonald's all day working. Okay. So and then after three weeks, away. after three weeks, McDonald's worked out what I was doing. They contacted my parents. Mum and dad and myself had a chat. We sat down and I said to them, listen, I'm happier at work. I enjoy the process at work a lot more. I feel like um, I can fast track myself as a human being in that environment. I feel like I'm learning more. And mum and dad were unbelievable and said, listen, if you want to leave school, you've got to go to McDonald's and make sure you pick up full-time work. If you do, we'll allow you to leave. Which was, you know, from a parent at that age, um, a massive thing for me. And How they were really you supportive. At this point? 15. 15. Okay, so it's yeah. early school, you know. I, and similar to me, I left school at 16. My parents gave me every blessing as long as I was going to go and work hard and do what I loved. And for you then, that McDonald's and where did that move into? Because... I remember you telling me very early days you had great success sales-wise at Harvey Norman in the commercial sector. Yeah, well, that the next there's, a little bit before, there's a little bit before that. And that's when I learned that I maybe had a bit of ambition. So, like I said, work ethic was the first thing that I sort of added to my tool belt. I made it my mission. So, I went to my manager. I said, what's the alarm code? Why? Well, because I'm going to be the first in and last out. So, I'm going to need to open up and lock up. Yeah. And he's like, I could tell by his face, he was like all right, mate, like, all right, well, this is the alarm code. Bang, my little Nokia, put the alarm code in my contacts. And I went on to do that in real estate. I went on to do that in retail. Yeah, you basically, you want to know the alarm code. If you don't know the alarm code, you're not working hard enough because you need to know how to get in before anyone else and lock up when everyone else has gone home, right? So little things like that I was starting to do at a very young age. And then ambition kicked in. I was working next to a guy and all he'd ever do is moan. So he was at McDonald's. He just moaned. He's like, oh, you know, I was going to be a chef, but this and... I was thinking about doing a, being a chef in London, but this, and my brain went, well, hang on. Actually, that's quite logical. If I'm going to work in a kitchen, I might as well work in a real kitchen. London, that's like the pinnacle of the culinary world. Well, I was born in England, so I've got dual nationality. Do you know what? I've got nothing to lose. I'm 16 now. Yeah. This guy is 45. If I don't do it, I'm, I'm going to end up as him. That fear, that, it's that if fear, he isn't is, it? He is basically the visualization of someone that isn't doing what I'm prepared to maybe now go and do. That's, yeah. that's my alternative. That was almost like the way I sort of positioned it in my head. So I went home to mum and dad. I sat them down. I never forget. And I said, listen, if I'm going to work in a kitchen, I want to work in a real kitchen. I've got dual nationality. I've got enough money to go back to England. 
So at 16 and a half years of age, I moved back to London on my own. I went on Gumtree, got a room off Gumtree, share, house section, um, and basically had no job, but I knew I'd get one. And all I did is I sat down on a bit of paper. I wrote down the top five restaurants in London. I walked into the back of each one, because if you ever know a kitchen, which, you know, it's not hard to work out. If you ever see those crates, the milk crates out the back, yep. that's where they sit and smoke. But there's always a back door with a sink. So I knew if I walked in the back door, I could get into the kitchen without having to walk through the restaurant and try and grab one of the chefs. Made a list of the five restaurants that I felt would be a really good sort of place to work in London. I think it was like Marco Pierre White, Gordon Ramsay, John Tarot, uh, and someone else. And again, if you're going to do something, start at the top, work your way down, reverse engineer the market, try and become the best, work with the best, learn from the best, get pushed by the best. That was always my thinking. So I walked into the back of a restaurant called The Lux on Liverpool Street. Everyone turned around as if to say, like, are you trying to break in? And I just said, can I please speak to the head chef? This French guy came over. He said, how can I help? I said, my name's Ryan. I've just moved over from Australia. My dream is to be a chef in London. I'm prepared to work for two weeks for free. If in two weeks I'm still here, I'd like a job. He said, hurry the fuck up and get in the sink. And that's literally how I got my first job. He threw me in the sink, chucked me a bag of spuds, a bag of onions, a peeler. And he said, I need all them done in the next 20 minutes. And if you finish it before, get into the sink and start washing up. I made sure the onions were done. I made sure the spuds were done. Chopped them all up, bucketed them up, put them down, got into the sink, started spraying his pans. And after three days, he said, um, you need to go upstairs, speak to a lady. She's going to sort your uniform. Make sure you're in. You're doing split shifts. And that was it. And people say to me now, where did you go to school? I went to school in a kitchen. Everything I've learned in a kitchen, I've translated into business. Work ethic, discipline, structure, attention to detail, cut the shit, get the job done. That's it. It's a simple That's method, it. isn't it? It's a simple method. Boil things down to the absolute fact and work up from there. Um, so now I'm working in a kitchen in London. And again, I want to learn. I don't want to be in the sink. So I say to the chef, listen, how do I get half an hour of your time? This was a chef that you had to... So basically in a kitchen, it's very army-like if you're in a good one. It's very, very, very disciplined. Uh, it's chaos, but it's organized chaos. The chef that I was working for at the time, it sounds quite narcissistic, but it's not. It's just the way they work. You had to go up and say, permission to speak, chef. If you said yes, you were allowed to ask a question. If you said no, you move on. And you've got to go and figure that problem out yourself. Um, <clears throat> depending on how busy he was, depending on what he was in the middle of, was ultimately going to determine your answer. But went up to him one day and I said, permission to speak, chef. He said, yeah. I said, how do I get half an hour of your time every day? He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm not learning anything. I'm in a sink. Like, uh, I appreciate I've got the job. I've been here now two months. I'm not learning anything. I'm learning what I can hear, but I'm a very visual learner. I need to do it myself. He goes, how are your knife skills? I said, well, they're good because I've cut about a million potatoes. He started laughing. And I said, well, listen, I just need half an hour of your time every day to, to learn a dish, improve my palate, whatever it is I need to do. He said, well, listen, I'll do you a deal. He said, I have a skinny latte, right? He said, if you come in in the morning, my board's out, my knife's sharpened, you've done my prep list, you've made me my coffee, and you've got all my herbs out and picked, you've just bought me half an hour. If those five things are done, for that half an hour you've saved me, I'll teach you something. If those five things aren't done, I'll assume for that day, you don't want an education, and I'll just go about my normal day. Yeah, wow. Every single day for six months, those five things got done. Every day, didn't miss a beat. I was in before him, I got it done. I stayed after him, alarm code left. And he basically started to fast track me as a chef, and within a year, I was junior sous, uh, I'm now on the pass, I'm calling dockets, I'm doing my own cooking, I'm deboning quails, I'm deboning fish. Basically got myself where I'm like, okay, I'm now a chef, I feel like a chef. And then the last element, and this leads into probably the next bit, I was sat there one day and I could hear him on the phone and he was French, so his English was good, but it was quite broken. And he was trying to negotiate a deal for some zucchinis, carrots, potatoes, whatever. Chefs think people just cook, uh, sorry, people think chefs just cook. There's another side to it. It's the business side. You've got to work on your margins. You've got to make sure that based on what you're paying for the ingredients and what you're selling the dish for, you're making a profit. Is that covering the overheads of the chefs? Is that covering the salaries? Is that covering maybe a dip in the bar for the week? So, you know, there's a lot to the mechanics economically of a restaurant. So I'm listening to him on the phone. I'm like, I could do that better. In my head, I'm like, like I, I believe I could get a better deal than whatever he's trying to do in there. So I said to him, I said, listen, I'll do you a deal. <clears throat> and he said, what? I said, if I can get those vegetables from the same supplier cheaper than you, that's now my job. And he said, all right, off you go. 
and I saved him like 80 pounds, right? Yeah. But over the course of a year, that 80 pounds a week is quite a lot of money. <clears throat> Definitely. Adds up. It does. So that was my first taste of negotiating. First taste of brokering a deal, a vegetable. <laughs> um, the first deal I ever brokered was a carrot or a potato or something. I can't remember yeah, wow. now. Um, and that's when I went, you know what? I like being on the phone to people. And I was still very shy. I was still very sort of self-conscious. I felt like I was a weird looking Australian hybrid English kid that was like really trying to find his feet. But I always used to look out at the past when I was putting the food up and I'd see people in suits. I'd see people having business meetings. I, I'd see life. And I used to look out and go like, where do I fit in amongst all that? I really don't know. And I had no confidence. But on the phone, no one can see you. Yeah. And so that I was just like, something I come to then learn about you later on and which will be part of the story <laughs> later on. There's, there's fish and then there's another human being when, when he's on the phone. And it's, it's almost scary to watch. But yeah, carry on. Yeah, well, this is probably where it stems from. Um, the phone for me is the battleground. Like that, that's where all business deals are won or lost. That's where meetings are set. That's where follow-up meetings are booked. That's where carrots and vegetables get sold for a very good deal. Yeah. Um, so from a very early age, I'm now on the phone and I'm dealing, with, I'm dealing with men. I'm dealing with adults. I'm in a room full of adults. So I've left school and I'm now in a room full of grown men. So I'm having to grow up quickly as well and adjust and adapt. Um, so yeah, I did that for three and a half years. And then I returned to Australia. I decided I didn't want to cook anymore. I felt like I'd, I'd done it. I'd gone to London. I'd, I'd ticked that box. I felt like, and this is probably a bit of advice I'd give to anyone. You're never above your current circumstance. So just because you're doing something at the time doesn't mean, okay, you're going to go on to do that for the next 15 years. But you owe it to yourself and you also owe it to the people that you work with at the time. So imagine it's a sponge full of water and extract every little bit that you can out of it. You owe that to yourself as a person trying to excel, but you also owe that to the people that have given you the opportunity or the platform to work with them. So I've always said, you're never above your current circumstance. Whatever you're doing, whether it's McDonald's, cooking, real estate, retail, football, for me, I'll make sure that I go into that industry and give it 150%. Um, so I felt like I'd done that in the cooking world. I felt like I couldn't really achieve anything more um, personally. So I came back to Australia. My dad's been in cars his whole life. I said to my dad, listen, um, I want to get into cars. I want to get into business. I want to get into sales. And my dad said, listen, if you're going to sell something, sell houses, right? You're too ambitious. You'll get into cars. The ceiling that you'll hit is a franchisee. You'll end up with two or three showrooms and that's it, you know? Um, so maybe look at a different avenue. He said, but you've got no experience. Go and get a job in a retail shop first. Uh, get some base experience and then that will lead you into something. And it was the best advice ever. So returned to Australia and then I went and got a job at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I went and got a job at Harvey Norman uh, in Bundle in the Gold Coast. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but it's actually the biggest uh, retail store in Australia. Yeah, wow. Which I didn't know. Yeah, um, I didn't so know a bit, of, bit of luck there. So it was actually quite a good platform to learn from. Turn up, first day, no experience. Listen, we like your attitude. You're very positive. Uh, we like the fact that you can work full time because you're not at school. We'll give you a job, but you are in the toaster section. You are selling toasters. Now, that's not really a hard job. You basically say to someone, which color would you like, mate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've got a matching jug, the same yeah. color. You have to see uh, Wendy from the jug section. No, exactly. I mean, they all do the same thing. You put your bread in. You wait 20 yeah. seconds, pop out. So it's not a hard sell. <clears throat> um, but basically the way the store was laid out was there was like a TV section, a kitchen section. So like ovens, cooktops, fridges, range hoods. Uh, there was white goods, which is fridges, washing machines, wine fridges, bar fridges, and then appliances, which is like toasters, kettles, you know, bar fridges, this, that, and the other. So, to go back, the first thing I added to my tool belt was work ethic. The second bit was ambition, having the ambition to go to London. So I now know that I've got a work ethic and I know that I'm ambitious. So I've added two things to my tool belt now by the age of 20 that I'm, I'm really sort of starting to like about myself. Um, and that I know are skills that sound basic, but not a lot of people apply them. Not a lot of people 
are ambitious all the time, uh, which is fine. Everyone's got a different metric. Um, but I think people could be a little bit more. I think if you back yourself and if you just take that risk, people will be out there pleasantly surprised with some of the things that you learn along the way and some of the things that you can go on to achieve. Understood. Work ethic. Work ethic. It's basic. It is so basic. It really is. But it's discipline. And when motivation passes you by, the thing that will save you is discipline, uh, which we'll probably get onto a bit more as we go. So I'm now at Harvey Norman. I'm told you can't leave the toaster section. That's your section. And I'm like, well, listen, lads, I'm going to have one person come in an hour. So what am I doing for the other um, 55 minutes? And this saying, it's my least favorite saying in the world. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, mate, I could not make my section any cleaner. I can yeah. see my face on the carpet. Mate, we're on, yeah, you're like, we're not actually toasting bread here, mate. Nothing <laughs> moves. There's no crumbs. Yeah. So you go, so, so how, how does that then play out? So I've now got time to think because for every 55 minutes that I'm not doing something, there's only five minutes that I am, which is when a customer comes in and asks me for a red toaster or a yellow toaster. Yeah. So I just had a lot of time to watch what was going on. The kitchen guy was leaning on the oven. The telly guy was not selling tellies. There's customers walking around that no one's speaking to. So I was just like, I, I can't get in trouble for making money for the business. Yeah. Like surely. The worst thing they can do is sack me for trying to make the money. So yeah. I just started going around talking to people in the shop. What are you after? I need a TV. Beautiful. Come with me. What size do you want? And all of a sudden I'm selling a telly. And because of my background in the kitchens, I've used ovens. I've got stories to tell about when I was in London and I used a, a pyrolytic oven and how much better they are because they self-clean. And I just had all this knowledge about the product. Yeah. The next minute, someone would walk in for a telly. I've sold them a telly, a fridge, an oven, a cooktop. Someone would walk in for a toaster. I've sold them a toaster, a range and a microwave. So I start basically pinging around this shop. And I knew I was doing the right thing because people were like, that worked there were like, bloody hell, like he's, he's everywhere here. And they're starting to get uncomfortable because they're like, God, this guy can Which is the best. all our jobs. Yeah. Which is the best. Yeah. Because, it, and listen, that can sometimes be good because it brings everyone up. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so anyway, I start doing a few extra sales and then I went, you know what? I've got about half an hour here in between customers where I'm doing nothing. So I went to my boss, I said, listen, give me a phone. And this was my first taste of being a bit of a business within a business, which helped me a lot in real estate. Okay, Harvey Norman, Harvey Norman got them in the door, right? The brand, yep. the exposure, Harvey Norman got them in, but I'm the one selling to them. I'm the one that's got to make that connection. I'm the one that's got to have the product knowledge. I'm the one that's got to interact and build rapport with them. I'm the one that's ultimately got to close the deal. Yep. If it wasn't, Harvey Norman wouldn't have any staff. You'd just walk in, pick it off the shelf and have, have, a, have a counter server. Definitely. So for every business out there that's in sales, the people you've got within it are so important. Um, and obviously... Went to my boss, said, listen, I need a phone. And all I started to do was in between customers, I'd ring businesses. Yep. So I'd ring a hairdresser, I'd ring a dentist, I'd ring a mechanic. Anywhere that I knew had a tea room out the back. And I'd say, my name's Ryan Fish from Harvey Norman. Just want to give you a quick call. I'm doing an unbelievable package on a kettle, a microwave, a bar fridge and a toaster. Or there's a tier two package of a microwave grill, which is unbelievable. You can do croissants, grilled cheeses, you know, all this sort of stuff. I know that you're a mechanic, you're bound to have a tea room. Do you need to update the stuff that you've got? I know you're a hairdresser, you're bound to have a tea room. Do you need to upgrade the stuff that you've got? Well, actually, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Beautiful. What I'll do is I'll throw in free delivery. I'll get it all sent out to you. And the stuff that you've got in there, we'll donate that to charity for you. They can't say no. It's, it's, yeah. it's a win, 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 right? Yeah. All of a sudden, my sales took off. Next minute, my little phone rings on the side of my pocket. Ring, ring, come upstairs. My boss, Steve, sat me down. He said, listen, don't know what you're doing down there, but your sales are, are very good. We're going to take you out of retail and we're now going to put you into commercial. I said, well, what's that? He said, we're going to give you a car allowance. We're going to put you onto an increased salary and we're going to ship you out to the middle of the Gold Coast of Brisbane to a place that we have set up. You're now going to sell a thousand ovens, a thousand cooktops, a thousand fridges to builders, developers and architects all across Queensland. 
So basically when a development goes to tender and they basically choose an architect and a developer to do the, to do the build, every single one of them apartments needs an oven. Every single one of them apartments need a washing machine. So it's my job to now find developers, builders and architects who want to sell, oh, sorry, buy appliances and I've got to then sell them the contract, lock in the contract two years before the build, get a deposit, get the orders built into the system, all this sort of stuff. So I'm now dealing with builders, developers and architects. I used to go down to the site. I'd make a list of all the sites coming up, going to tender that had just been announced with a developer. I'd get in my car, I'd drive to the site with six coffees. I'd go to the foreman, I'd go to the builder, I'd work my way to the architect, I'd find out who the head developer is, I'd speak to the head developer, and basically just leverage myself up the site until I got to who I needed to speak to, who was the decision maker, and started negotiating the contracts for the appliances. What started to happen was, these developers and architects were like, mate, you should be in real estate. Why are you yeah. selling toasters? Why are you selling fridges? If you're gonna sell something, sell houses. That's what my dad said. Maybe I'm ready now. Maybe that apprenticeship's over. So I sat down and I went, okay, I'm going to give this another six months. I'm going to put as much money behind me as I can. And I'm going to transition into real estate. In that six months, I started researching the market. I looked at Melbourne, I looked at Sydney, and I looked at the Gold Coast. Now in the Gold Coast, with all due respect, it's a wonderful part of the world. In real estate, it's very loud. It's Lamborghinis. It's, yeah. you know, it's sun surf and boobs, basically. And I'm a pasty white English lad, and it just ain't me. Yeah. It just ain't. Um, so I crossed the Gold Coast market off and I looked at um, Sydney and Melbourne. Because I'd lived in London, I was a bit worried about living in a big city again. I didn't really enjoy it. I felt Sydney was too big. That was my only logic. I was like, I don't want to go to a massive city again. Yep. I know Melbourne's a massive city, but from what I'd heard, you could drive from one side of Melbourne to the other in 20 minutes without getting stuck in traffic. In Sydney, it can sometimes take you two hours to get from one part of it to the other. Yeah. So I also knew that if I go to Melbourne, um, I just felt like it would be easier to settle in. I don't know why. That's just what I thought. Yep. So I made a list of three or four real estate agents who were perceived to be the best in the market. Um, it was your Marshall Whites, your Greg Hawkins, your Kay Burtons, and I think it was like an RT Edgar or, or something like that. They were the four. Got on the phone to all of them, uh, spoke to one of them, spoke to the other one, spoke to the other one, arranged three interviews, drove down to Melbourne, sat with each three of them, and then one of them offered me a job. And he basically said, listen, when can you start? I said, I'll move down as soon as you need me. Went back to the Gold Coast, resigned with Steve. Steve gave me his blessing, packed up all my stuff, moved to Melbourne, got myself a little one-bedroom apartment in St Kilda. Absolute hole. So everyone's like, mate, you've got to live in St Kilda. It's, it's the place to be. Right, so you go, you go off it because you don't know any different. Yeah. Mate, I ended up renting a one, which is funny because I ended up in real estate and I'm giving people property advice. I ended up renting a one bedroom apartment next to a council estate. <laughs> <laughs> and I still had the worst car in the area. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't that funny though? Because people said the same to me. Oh, like St Kilda, you should try to live near St Kilda. Is it just like, I think it's just the outsider's impression. No, no, no that people think that, spot, right? people yeah. think, that, I guess people thought I was moving to Melbourne to party and have fun. Yeah, okay. Now listen, if you want to party and have fun, go to St Kilda. You're, yeah. not, you're not short of a party, you know? Yeah. Uh, but that's not why I'd gone there. I'd gone there to like really engage my brain and like try and kick on professionally. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I do things at 100 miles an hour. I've sort of, I'm a little bit pacier now. I've got a bit more control over my, my sort of decision making, but I'm 21 at the time. I think I was, no, 20, 23 I was at this time. I've got cash on the hip. I took the apartment without even seeing it. I did it all online because I just wanted to get a place. I wanted to show the real estate company I'd already got a place, show I was organized, you know, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, I turned up, mate. You should, if, I wish someone had a photo of my face when I got to this place. Um, like, yeah. It, yeah. Actually, it was I, really I remember bad. you telling me stories about this place now, so I remember yeah, stories. Well, yeah, it, it ain't the best. So anyway, yeah. I move in and I'm like, well, listen, I justified it by, listen, you've got a massive incentive to stay in the office because you don't want to be coming home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. Turn a negative so into like, a positive. I'm going to stay in that office until I'm literally about to conk out, get in the car, quickly drive home, get into bed, fall asleep, and pretend I don't live here. It, it, it yeah. was really, 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 really shit quite, that quite place. Sad, yeah. 
yeah, it, it wasn't a good environment to like be positive. So um, anyway, I've locked myself into a lease. I can't afford to break the bond. I've just got to stick it out. I start working at this real estate company. Second day, I say to him, can I please have the alarm code? He says, what for? I say, well, I'm going to stay back of an evening and make phone calls to all your old open for inspection sheets and try and build up some, you know, clients and book some meetings and this, that and the other. Now, anyone that gets into real estate is told to start on one bedroom flats. You've got to start on one bedroom flats, learn the industry and work your way up. Everyone's told that you need to work under a director. Um, you basically get on the phone, do your buyer work, set as many appraisals or meetings as you can. The director will come and clean up the business and basically secure it. You're basically just told to find your feet, which is fine. I respect that. You're never above your current circumstance. You've got to... Sorry, mate. You're all right, Wow. Wow. <laughs> Hey, surprise to any of you fuckers listening that just cop that. That little alarm in the back. Do you know your alarm code, mate? <laughs> haven't given me yet. Yeah, um, carry on. So it's my second day. I say to him, you know, can I have the alarm code? And he says, why? I said, well, because I'm going to stay back of an evening and make calls. Um, so I'm going to be you know, needing to lock up. And he goes, oh, you can't ring people after six o'clock at night, mate. I said, well, why not? And he said, well, you know, you don't want to interrupt people at dinner and, you know, people don't know you in the area. No one's heard of your name. And I was like, okay. I said, so when, when do you want me to ring people? And he goes, you've got to ring in between 7.30 in the morning or around 8 in the morning till 10 a.m. I said, so when they're getting up to work and stuck in traffic and getting the kids out the door, and you know, that, that's, you think that's the best time to be ringing people? Yeah, 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 mate. This is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Right, okay. Well, I'll take that on board. Woke up the next morning, came in, eight o'clock, got on the phone. I think two people answered after 30 calls. Two. Yeah. So I'm like, this is a broken model. Also, I looked around, no one else is in the office doing it. Yeah. So I was like, well, if it's that effective, why is no one in here absolutely humming on this, on this model that is apparently what you need to do to get into the market? Um, took me to an appraisal. Listen, I'm sure I was. I was probably quite intense because I can, I can be sometimes, but... You know, I sat down, introduced myself to this lady in an appraisal that the guy I was working with at the time had basically said, listen, come in, don't say anything, I'll run the meeting. I got in, sat down and basically tried to run the meeting myself. But that was just enthusiasm. That was just me trying to, you know, show him that I guess, I, listen, I'm, I'm all right. Sorry, mate. No, you're right, we're good. Um, and on the Friday, he sat me down and sacked me. Yeah, wow. So I basically moved all the way from Melbourne, uh, sorry, from the Gold Coast to Melbourne. To get into real estate, I've sat down with this guy, I got a job. After a week, he sat me down and said, listen, real estate's not for you. It's just not. You know, you're a little bit too out there. You probably, you know, you can't be calling people mate on the phone. You can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. Just basically give me a list of things that apparently you can't do. The thing that I took away from it, though, is that that's not the response I was getting from the people I was calling. So I was ringing people of an evening, um, you know, four, five, six, seven o'clock, because he wasn't letting me stay back any later. And, mate, I was connecting with them. I was getting addresses. People were telling me what their buying requirements were. I was getting an appraisal for the week after. So I was like, well, hang on. I'll take it on board. But I can't be doing that much wrong because the people that I'm speaking to, and listen, some people were hanging up. Some people were saying, you know, I'm not interested. But that's, that's cold calling. You're going to get that yeah, whether that's, that's you're doing anything and whatever your personality is. So I took a little bit of solace in the fact that, well, hang on, I'm making connections here. I'm getting through to people. Um, and I'm going to hold on to that, and I'm just going to lock that away. I was then absolutely skint. I had no money. I'd spent the last bit of money I had on my deposit, and my, my logic was I get the deposit, I furnish the flat, I get myself a little car, I get set up, and then I'm going to start earning a salary as a base, and then after six months, I'll sell a house, and everything will be fine. That's not what happened. So I put all my eggs in the basket of the relocation cost. I got fired. I got paid like $60, $60 because it was prorated for the month, and I'd only worked three days or something. Yeah. Um, got taxed on that for some reason because I'd earned enough money in the Queensland job beforehand. So I, I mean, I paid $45. Uh, <laughs> not, so, not what everyone had told you about real estate, eh? Nah. So at this point, mate, I'm, I'm in a world of trouble. I'm skint. I'm unemployed. Um, I feel like a failure because obviously on the way out of Queensland, I've told everyone, you know, thanks for everything, but I'm going to go and you know, try and do the best I can in the real estate industry now. And um, I felt like I just flopped. 
Uh, and I felt like it was like because of me as a person, because I was told the feedback I was told was, you know, it's you. It's you. It's personal. You, you're not. You're not suited to real estate. Um, so you know that was a lot to take in at that age. Um, and I thought, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is right. You, you start thinking that. So I had to go and get a job, and. I knew I was going to give real estate another go. And I also knew that if I was going to get into real estate, I needed to be accessible between the hours of 8 a.m. and around 9 p.m. Because you need to be very flexible around, A, the workload in order to get on the phone and make the calls, but also go into the meetings and the appraisals and the follow-up emails and everything that you need to do if those meetings take place. So I said to myself, well, I need to get a job out of hours and I need to get a job that no one's going to see me ever doing. Because it's a bit... You can't get a job in hospitality as a waiter or, you know, in a bar. And then you're on the phone all day speaking to people in the market. You go and have an appraisal with, you know, John Smith. And then at eight o'clock at night, John Smith and his wife walk into a cafe or a restaurant and you're behind the bar going, all right, John. Basically, yeah, like, well, open, yeah. yeah, it, it doesn't work. Mm. You know, a real estate agent who's busy does not have a bar job. And a real estate agent who isn't busy clearly isn't very good at selling houses or doesn't have any experience. So, I knew I had to sort of keep myself out of the public eye, but I had to earn an income. So my idea was to get a job as a cleaner because I knew that I could work from midnight till 4 a.m. I could earn some really good money. You can earn some really good money in cleaning. Um, so basically, I got a job with this guy and my job was to clean shoe shops, offices, dental practices. I cleaned the dental practice in Elwood. I cleaned a shoe shop in the city and I cleaned a shoe shop in Hawthorne. That was my circuit. So every night from about 11.30 p.m. till about 3.30 a.m., I'd get in my car with my little jetpack vacuum, and I'd go around and I'd clean those three sites. I'd get paid, and I'd go to bed. And then I'd wake up all day and try and find myself a job. Before that, I'd connected with someone on Facebook named Marty. Me and him had started chatting, you know, sort of loosely. Um, I noticed he was in real estate. I didn't know to what extent. I didn't really understand the industry. All I knew was he was a director at some, at some company. And anyway, he asked me how I was getting on with the company I was at previously. I said, listen, they've let me go. He said, why? We got on the phone. We had a chat. And realistically speaking, that's sort of where it all sort of changed direction. So we had a conversation. I explained the way I felt that I needed to go about it and where I think, you know, they were maybe wrong. He agreed with a lot of what I was saying. And he just said, listen, I'll give you a run. So long story short, he took me under his wing for, for 12 months, uh, sorry, 12 weeks at a company that he was working at at the time. And he just said, listen, I'm going away overseas. This is my stock. If you can sell it, great. I'll speak to you every day. I'm a director at the company, so I can hire you as a you know, contractor or whatever it was at the time. Uh, you'll get paid X, Y, Z amount if you do X, Y, Z amount. Um, I need you to look after my house. I need you to walk my dog. I basically need you to run my life for 12 weeks. If you do that, when I get back, I'm going to show you something. I said, okay, sound. He went away. I sold everything. I sold six properties, walked his dog, looked after his house, basically did everything I felt that I could do. He returned. We sat down. And then that's when he introduced to me a company that he was looking to launch um, a year later. So, the issue, uh, six months later, sorry. So the issue I now had was he then left the business that he'd hired me under. He had to do a six month non-compete. So I'm now unemployed again for six months, and waiting for this business to out, start. Yeah. So mum and dad live up in Cairns. I went up to Cairns. I got a job as a, a waiter at a restaurant for six months. Um, I was doing the, the sink. I was, I was waiting tables. I was doing functions at weddings. And basically for six months, I just put my head down, banked as much money as I could to return to Melbourne with for the launch date uh, of White Fox on the 1st of Feb, 2017, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and then on that first day, sat down with very minimal real estate experience, a new business, no contacts, no real previous experience in the market. And um, my real estate career began. Talk to me about, so this is the part of the story where I love, and this is kind of, you know, only about six months a year, I think it's probably a year later where I come into the play and meet you for the first time. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But, you know, it's, you know, a lot of people hear that and they go, well, his real estate career started. You've sold all of those properties you had at the old company. You've proven that you've got the skill set to sell a piece of real estate to connect with people in that industry. But it wasn't necessarily walk back in, 
turn the phone on and things just start happening, no, no. was it? No, and that's no. probably, the, I think, the misconception here is people sometimes don't understand or don't hear that story of the next three months. So talk to yeah. us about turning that phone on again and getting things moving. I still remember... So the first day, mate, I've got no hesitation in saying this. I was sort of walking around pretending like I knew what I was doing because I didn't want to be found out. Yeah. I always felt like I was like, like, you know, Marty, I think it was his wife, the admin lady, Steph. I was like, fuck, I hope these guys like... <laughs> yeah. I need to try and convince these guys that I can actually do this. You yeah. know what I mean? So... I remember the first day was very odd, very odd. I was given this room upstairs and Marty basically said to me, listen, fish, he goes, just be yourself. He goes, don't do anything illegal, right? Yeah. Anything else, go for it. Like, just, just, just do what you think is instinctive. And I've got to give him credit for that because that really calmed me down and just made me go, all right, okay. He's, he's backing me into the market here. It takes courage as a leader, doesn't it, to allow that? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it does. Um, so, you know, we're sitting there and I just start looking for ways to be good. That, that's, it's like, you know, with football. And I didn't really know I was doing it at the time. And listen, you, you've worked there. Um, the marketing was done in a way which was significantly different to anything else in the market at the time. Yeah, correct. So, you know, the video content was was better, I would say. Um, some of the sort of marketing tactics that were being thrown around definitely weren't being done. Um, you know, a lot of it was being done, but maybe not to the same standard, I would say. Um, okay. So I knew that I was maybe in a business that was going to stand out, but my logic in life with a lot of things is there's no point having a Ferrari without the engine in it. Yeah. Right. So it's all well and good looking shiny. It's all well and good looking, um, looking the bollocks, right. But do you have a set of bollocks? Can, can you actually do the work? So I very quickly sort of thought to myself, all right, I don't want to just be a guy that works at this new agency just because it looks good. I don't want to just be associated by default. I actually want to like, I want to help him drive it. I want to drive it for myself. And I want to, I want to make sure that there's some substance to the work that I'm doing. So I just basically started to engage my brain in a bit of a different way. I just, one of the biggest bits of advice, and it's one of the best things that I've probably done. Um, and it was something that was taught to me. Going back to the kitchen very quickly, as an example, the chef that I worked for would come to me at the end of the shift. He'd grab my bin and he'd empty it on the floor. He would then stand there and work out how much money I'd cost him that day. Yeah. So he'd say, listen, you could have cut this onion closer to the, to the end. You could have cut this carrot closer. You've, you've damaged some of my herbs. Why have you not cut these herbs down? And he said, listen, all of that will accumulate to you costing me money over the course of the year. Be better. Increase your standards. Have more detail. So what that taught me was don't always look at what people are doing. Look at what they're not doing. Now, funnily enough, if you actually stop and have that conversation, you have a very, very different dialogue with your brain. Because what a lot of people tend to do, what a lot of people tend to do is go, what's everyone doing? I need to do that better. I need to do that faster. I need to do that shinier. I need to do that louder. No, 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 no. Look at what people aren't doing. Okay, you've got to do what they are doing because clearly it works to an extent. So, you know, do that. But the things that I've always tried to excel at are the things that the people aren't necessarily doing. So one of the biggest things I started to hear about real estate uh, agents, they never even call you back, mate. Like, you know, they only ring you if they want a listing. Or, uh, you know, it wasn't even on time. Or, mate, I haven't had an email off him for six months. He only pops up whenever he wants. These were sort of the things that I'd started to hear from buyers or in the market or just, just in general. Because when you're in an industry, you hear things, right? It's very well connected, isn't it? Exactly. So I sat down, I went to myself, okay, how do I go about this? I need to set up myself a little system. I knew I was good on the phone, right? I'm not the sort of person that networks in the way of, yeah, let me take you for dinner. Let's go for dinner and, and build that relationship and then nurture that relationship. And, you know, how are the kids? And that's not me. 
that, that, that's just not me. I prefer to have a relationship with someone that I'm working with as, listen, I'm gonna live and breathe the process from a commercial perspective to maximize your outcome. At the end of that process, by default, there'll be a level of respect because of the way I've gone about my business. And if we become friends off the back of that, great. But this is a business relationship. So I almost went into a very robotic mode with my dialogue and the system that I implemented in the market. I reverse engineered the market in a way as well. So what a lot of people tend to do, as I said to you when you get into real estate, is say, you need to start on one bedroom flats. Now, Marty had sort of signified a difference in the market by saying, we do not sell anything below a million dollars. And that's because he wanted to have a brand that represented high end, right? Yep. Which was great because for me, I was like, okay, well, I'm on board with that because I don't believe I need to start on one bedroom flats. If you know enough about the property, if you're upfront and transparent, if you know how to communicate, you know how to negotiate and facilitate a process, you can build rapport with people and you handle a situation to a standard. It doesn't matter whether it's 1 million, 10 million or 100 million, you can sell whatever that asset is. I agree. Okay. So I knew the that. The process doesn't really change that much outside of a few things, does it? No. Well, if anything, and I don't mean to sound rude here, when you sort of move up to a higher end of the market, whether that's in football, whether that's in property, probably whether that's in many industries, what you tend to find is you are dealing with people who have obtained a skill set or level of wealth or um, a life experience background or whatever that's allowed them be, to be positioned at that end of the market. So what you're actually dealing with are people who just want to get business done. Yeah, definitely. Definitely so, that was the point of difference for me there. The thing that I really noticed between Melbourne and Wollongong was mm -hmm. that the, the different people that you're dealing with and they are very commercially driven. Yeah, very. Um, so sat down, you know, new brand, new market, new industry, new agent, broke, I've still got my cleaning job at this time. Um, so I'm still cleaning bathrooms and toilets of an evening, um, which was hard. I'm in a $2,000 Toyota Camry and I'm working for a luxury real estate brand. Like it doesn't make sense. It doesn't even match up to a inch of a degree. Um, and I just locked myself in that office. You can ask anyone that worked there with me. I mean, you, you sort of had, a, I literally locked myself into that office and I lived on a phone. So I went back um, and I was calling people who had previously had their house on the market two years before who hadn't sold. I was looking in the paper at houses that hadn't sold at auction. One of the biggest things I picked up on straight away was, okay, I'm going to need a point of difference. I could not get my head around the auction process. It made no commercial sense to me. No commercial sense at all. I'll tell you why. As an agent, the best interest for me is my client. Whoever entrusts me to sell their asset, my job is to maximize that asset within the market. Now that comes down to strategy, it comes down to price, it comes down to the way it's represented, the way it's communicated, the workload that gets put in, okay? Now I'm not saying the auction process doesn't work, that's not what I'm saying. It was just my opinion. I couldn't understand it because if I've got my client's best interests, right, my job is to get them the best price I possibly can and protect their asset in the market until I do. Why on earth would I quote their property lower than what I'm trying to sell it for? Yeah. I didn't understand that. Especially now, what the they then turn around and say to you is, well, you're going to get a lot of excitement and a lot of engagement. Yeah, to get me back to the price that it's worth. Yeah. Then you've got to try and go over and above that. Yeah. Now, what happens if that doesn't happen? Well, then the whole world knows what the property didn't sell for. You're then negotiating for a position of weakness because you're, you've lost your leverage. Yeah. Because you're now at a price that people go, well, hang on, it didn't sell at auction for that. So why are you still asking for that? So I reverse engineered it and I said to Fox, I said, listen, I just need you to know for as long as I work here, I'll never stand on an auction. I don't want to be seen at one. I don't want to represent one. I knew that having that point of difference would help me in the higher end straight away. Commercially, my brain worked that out because people with an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, seven, two and a half, $3 million house want discretion, they want a bit of privacy, they want a bit of decorum, they want a level of sophistication in the way they're doing business, and they don't want 60, 70 people traipsing through a house to build up an agent's database. They want a strategy that allows them to maximize the asset, and I started basically using that dialogue. So I'd contact properties who had passed in at auction, I'd contact properties that had failed at auction previously. My name's Ryan Fisher from White Fox, just wanted to give you a quick call. I noticed that your house is on the market in this month, I noticed that this was a strategy you implemented in, into the market with, I feel I've got a better strategy that could best basically suit the asset more and maximize the asset in a different way. All I need is 30 minutes of your time. I've put together a presentation outlining that strategy. When are you available? 
well, okay, this is out of the blue. Well, you're right. It did fail at auction. Well, you're right. I think we could have got more. You're right. I don't think that was the right strategy. You're right. You've got on the phone and, you know, had the bollocks to give me that call. Okay, you've got a strategy. Okay, it's only going to cost me half an hour of my time. Okay, you're bringing me a coffee. When can I see you? Not a problem. Bang, my diary started filling up. So now all of a sudden I've got a lot of meetings. So I'm now prepping the meetings. Now when you prep a meeting, how much detail are you going into? Are you just putting a photo of yourself and saying, I work for a real estate company, please give me an opportunity. These are the marketing costs. Yeah. I became very data and analytically driven. So again, you boil everything down to the absolute minute fact and you build from there. How do you value a house? Capital growth, land value, square meter rate yield, return on investment. You put all those things into a pot, cook it up, that gives you a value. My job is to sell it for more than that. So going through that exercise forced me to find a strategy to get more for the asset, which gave me an education and I became incredibly rich with information very quickly because all I was looking at was the market in a very microscopic way. I'd then get to the meeting, I'd sit down and I started to feel very quickly that people hadn't seen this before. Wow, I've not seen this detail. It's usually, uh, my, my, name's, my name's Ryan, I work for this real estate company. We've sold over 500 houses in the area. We've got a team. Um, this is the marketing costs. These are the calendars. These are the best auction dates. These are the school holidays. This is when we need to position your house. This is when we think you should sell it. Happy to do it at a 1% fee because we really want your business. You know, if you can't even negotiate a good fee, how are you meant to negotiate a better price on the asset? That's what I'd say to someone. Well, what's your fee? Well, it's 1.8%, but they're only 1%. Well, if that's how they negotiate with their money, I'd hate to see them negotiate with yours. Yeah. So it was about building a reputation that I felt like as I continued into the market would stand me in good stead, which was to be incredibly effective with my communication, fix problems. And that's a bit of advice I'd give to anyone entering a market. Look for a problem to fix. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you're not a solution. Identify it. Yeah, otherwise you're not a solution. What gives you the right to walk into a market and take business off someone else unless you're fixing a problem that they're not? What gives you that right? You don't have it. You've got to earn the right. You've got to fix a problem that no one else is prepared to fix or no one else has the brain capacity to fix or wants to fix or has the drive to fix. That's what you've got to do. And I've done the same in football and I'll probably go on to do the same in any industry I walk into because I believe in that model. So I'm now doing this at repetition every day for six months, six months, six months, getting in the doors. I'm getting a few properties listed and then you create your own luck and a bit of luck fell on my doorstep. That bit of luck, if I'm remembering correctly, come through the sale of a property that had been a missed opportunity for a couple of agents. They couldn't get it done. You then connected with, I believe, the architect who passed you on to a man who managed a building. That building yeah. happened to be the home of Leighton and Beck Hewitt, a penthouse yeah. that had been on the market for something like six years. Yeah. Is that correct? Couldn't be sold yeah. by any international agent. You come in, I think if, you're, if I remember you saying this, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it was the first penthouse you ever walked into, I think you remember saying. Yeah, it was, it was. And before I tell you sort of what happened here, this is now when my brain started to engage with football again. So I think I should probably explain yeah, the relevance. That. Address that. Um, at this point, you can ask people, I would wake up listening to football. I'd fall asleep with it blaring in my ear. I became obsessed with football as a fan. So if I wasn't in a meeting at work or doing something that didn't allow me to do it, I was listening or reading to football, basically. I'd actually come across an article, Super Agent Brokers World Transfer Record. And it was like that day I walked into McDonald's. My brain just went click. And I went, ooh. What's this? Because I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't know there was a football market. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah, you just kind you just, of know there's a few guys that make sure players get to teams and that's kind of just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've read this article and it's basically about this guy called uh, Jorge Mendez. Brokers a world record transfer, represents Ronaldo and a stable of players. Works with some of the top elite clubs in world football. You know, broker's deals worth 80, 90, 150 million pounds. Um, gets to travel the world, watching World Cups, European Cups, experiencing different cultures, eating food. And I just looked at it and went, yeah, I'll have a bit of that. Yeah. Basically. Um, so automatically I went, okay, I need to start learning that. That almost became like 
my hobby in a way. I just started like obsessively learning about the transfer market. I looked at the agents that were in the game. Um, I looked at, you know, what was involved in a transfer. I started researching certain players, what, you know, the owners of clubs backgrounds were commercially, the land size of the stadiums. I just started like going into incredible detail of any spare time I had about that industry. And I just wanted to start learning it. The more I started learning about it, the more I started reading about it, I was like, yeah, this is, this is 100%, 150% my way back into football. 150%. I just knew. And I parked that idea and I just let it fester. So this was like right at the start of me in real estate again. It was r- right at the start. It was perfect timing because it gave me that next thing to drive me towards. Um, and almost in a way, my real estate career, I put so much into it to get me into football as soon as I could. Yeah. I think I was the only real estate agent that didn't want to be a real estate agent. Yeah. The only real estate agent who didn't want to be the number one real estate agent, but was probably working towards that just because it was a stepping stone anyways. Yeah. Well, again, you maximize wherever you are, like a sponge getting water. Um, I thought I owe it to myself. I owe it to Marty who's given me an opportunity. I owe it to the clients that I represent. I owe it to, you know, everything else really my parents everything whatever you want to factor in as a driver i owe it to all of those things to absolutely do my best to maximize this career while i'm in it and also leave in a better position as a human being financially and from a development perspective when i do that was my thought process so i was reading about the agency side of the game and i just thought to myself okay i've probably got the life experience to go in there and have a go financially i'm nowhere near where i need to be to have a comfortability factor to go over there and try and make that work um, I've got no experience in football. I've got no contacts in football. I've got no network in football. I've got no understanding really of the mechanics of the market because you can read about something as much as you want until you're in it. You don't know the mechanics of it. You don't know what it smells like, tastes like, looks like. You need to get into it. And I was learning that in real estate. Um, so I knew that I was you know, a long way away from maybe having the credentials to even attempt to try and get into football. Yeah. Um, and I'd never actually broken a deal above, you know, $50,000, which was an appliance contract. You know, what gave me the right to think that I'm ready to go over there and maybe broker a transfer for 50 million, 80 million pounds. So I knew that real estate would be the next stepping stone. So let's maximize that. And then going back to the apartment, like you said, um, it had been on the market for six years with three other agencies. No one could sell it. It belonged to a high profile pl- uh, tennis player. And um, I listed it. So I'm now in charge of trying to sell this thing. And I knew I had to do something no one else had done in order to sell it because otherwise it would have been sold. The first thing I did was I had to sit down and have an honest conversation with the owners around price. Now, sometimes in business and sometimes in life, you've got to be an inconvenient truth, but it's better than being an inconvenient lie. So my logic is always, I'd rather tell the truth and then have to go away and absorb that and me potentially lose the business than lie to get the business and then be on, on the wrong foot anyway. So 100%. It, and that's probably the biggest issue in real estate, right? Yeah. And that's where a, a lot degree, of reputations yeah. are buried because of that. Well, without realizing it, you just, you're missing opportunities left, right and center because people smell bullshit. Yeah, they do. Or you get found out eventually. So, you know, I've been in houses before with people where I sit down and they say, well, listen, the other agents told me it's worth four and a half million. Okay. But I'm telling you it's worth 3.8. Yeah, I know. But how, how can you guys be so different? Well, basically what they're telling you is whatever you want to hear to get the business. And then over the next six weeks, they're going to chip away you and tell you what I'm telling you now for free. Yeah. So you can either go with that agent or you can trust what I'm saying based off the fact and evidence that I put in front of you. Let me represent your home. Let me try and push for a higher price of what it's worth. But I'm telling you now, this is what it's worth. Now, eight times out of 10, people respond well to that because you've called the other agent out. You put forward a strategy that reflects what it is you're saying and the facts and they they buy into that and they respect it. Every two or three, every now and then, choose to believe what they want to hear, move on. And I used to track them. They didn't sell. Yeah, they never do. The worst thing that can possibly happen to a real estate agent is you list the house and you don't sell it. Yeah, that, That's the worst thing that can happen. So why would you put yourself into a situation where you're increasing your chances of doing that? It's not going to stand your career or your reputation any, any good stead. And that goes for any business that you walk into. You try and be as upfront and honest as you can. And one of my favorite sayings is you're entitled to your own opinion, but no one's entitled to their own facts. The facts are the facts. I love that. 
So you're sitting so in front of these people the and you're just representing facts. And are those yeah. facts extreme harsh realities at this point in time? Sometimes they are. But if that's the best thing for your client commercially, if that's the best thing for your relationship in order to build rapport, if that's your duty as someone who's representing the asset or doing business for them in the market, then you've got to have the bollocks to sit down and actually have that conversation. And so talk um, to me about this situation where you're sitting in front of the Hewitts or their representation and you're addressing that conversation with them. You know, they've probably not had this conversation for six years. No. And, you know, we sit there and the first thing I say is I just wanted to let you know that I don't like tennis. And Great way said, to start the chat. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, what I'm trying to explain to you is I'm not afraid to tell you the truth. Yeah. I've used that as a bit of an icebreaker, right? Yeah. The truth of the matter is the property is incredibly overpriced. It's depreciated in value since you bought it. It's got no land. Um, it's purely a lifestyle acquisition. And whoever buys it is going to be buying it to live here for the next 10, 15 years, knowing full well that there's large overheads on the residence and it's going to be a lifestyle acquisition to complement a life they've worked incredibly hard to obtain the resources to then buy this, to buy this asset. Therefore, we need to adjust the price. We're way off. I'm sorry if the other agents have led you down a path. I'm sorry if the other agents have not had the sort of courtesy, I guess, to sit down and have that conversation with you, but this is where it sits. Um, and I do believe that got me the business because it's what they needed to hear. It's what they deserve to hear. And it's ultimately what went on to get the deal done. You have to start the deal um, the best possible way in order to give you the chance and the probability of selling it. Like I said, I went away then and I thought to myself, okay, I need to do something no one else has done. Um, the marketing video we did, you know, credit to the team of people that I was working with at the time was very good. Um, I tapped into Sky. I tried to give it as much exposure as I could. Uh, but ultimately, I sat down on LinkedIn. I knew that my demographic of buyer was a high exec or a CEO. So I went onto LinkedIn. I set up a 25 kilometer radius from the residence, which basically gave me the whole of the CBD right the way out to the beach. And I just contacted CEOs and high execs who I knew had the network to sort of secure something like this. And I just sent them the residence. One day, my phone rang. It was a gentleman named Cliff. Um, and he just said, hi, Ryan, you're not going to believe this. I actually came through that property four years ago. Can't believe it's still on the market. I'd like to come and see it again. My circumstances have, have changed a little bit. When are you free? Now, when you're selling an apartment, you always take someone through in the morning first. Why? Because then you have to come back in the evening to sell it. If they accept an evening appointment, you've already gauged that there's any interest. If they knock back the evening appointment, which is when primarily you see the view, you know that potentially they're not interested and you can move on. So I met them there in the morning, sat them down. We had some croissants, a cup of tea. I sat back. I knew straight away I was in the room with some very decent human beings. Lovely, lovely people who weren't going to appreciate being messed about, who weren't going to appreciate anything other than the upfront truth, and who were going to be incredibly easy to deal with if you were incredibly easy to deal with. Business is simple. It's people who choose to complicate it. Don't. Just keep it simple. And if someone else chooses to complicate it, react. If they cross their arms, cross your arms. If they storm off, you sit down and be patient. But you react to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, business is simple. It's people that complicate it. So I said to him, listen, you're probably going to have to come back and see it in an evening. It's got 360 almost views of, of Melbourne. The master suite overlooks you know, the city skyline. It's unbelievable at night. Yeah, we'd love to see it. Can we come back and see it tonight? Okay, a bit of urgency. I'm starting to gauge that there's a bit of interest. Um, so basically, we've got it articulated on the market at 10 million. Um, I felt that a deal could maybe be done between eight and a half to nine. So Cliff came back in that evening. He said, look, we're interested. We're going to go away, run some numbers, speak to you next couple of days. A couple of days later, he gives me a call. Got an offer here, 7.9. So I get an offer in writing of 7.9 million. It's the first offer they've had on the property. It's a very strong offer. Now at the time to paint the picture, I had, and I still, I think Brad Ward, who you know, you know quite well, has a photo of me holding up, I think it's like $60 or something. I just paid my rent and my car and I had 60 bucks left. So I had $60 in my bank at this time. Yeah, I remember seeing this photo. Yeah. Um, and Brad took it without me realizing he was taking it because he was like, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm counting my life savings. <laughs> He's like, snap, took a photo. Yeah. <laughs> I had 60 bucks. Um, so, you know, I was, I was pretty skint. I was in a $2,500 Toyota Am uh, Camry that looked like an Uber. The wing mirror was all fucking bent in. Um, you know, Marty was calling me an Uber driver. 
people were laughing at me in the car. It was basically a moonship that hovered around Melbourne. Yeah. And I'd actually park this thing three or four streets away from the penthouse because I didn't want any of the buyers that I was taking through the apartment to see it. Yep. So anyway, <laughs> get the offer. Now, Cliff lived quite a way out of Melbourne. It was about 45 minutes away. So I get in my car. I bomb up the motorway for 45 minutes. Absolutely over the moon to go and sign up this offer. Sign it up, get back in the car, drive back. Now, the hardest part about this deal was that I could not get face to face with any of them in terms of the sellers. It was all it was all over the phone. Yeah. And you just draw on your previous experience. It's selling the vegetables, contacting the hairdressers, the mechanics. You know your your phone demeanor, your phone rhythm. You you just I don't know. It's a skill you you sort of develop as you go, really. So I'm on the phone and I'm trying to explain to them that you know we need to sort of keep momentum, get a bit of a strategy in place around where we're going to end up in terms of price. And um, Cliff had asked me previously, what will buy it? Now, I felt that a really good result for them was going to be around 8.5. Yeah. I just felt like if they were to get that, it, it would be a really, really strong result for everyone involved uh, in terms of the sellers. So I said to Cliff, I said, listen, if you give me an offer of 8.5, it's done. Anything below that, I can't guarantee you the residence. And what was his response to that at the time? Okay, I'll think about that. I'll go away. And then that's when he came to me with the offer that, um, that he did. So anyway, I've gone back. I presented it. Um, and they just said, no, nah, you know, we're way off. Okay, not a problem. They countersign it. I go back. And basically, I was going to and from, to and from, to and from. Um, I don't want to get into the final figures or sort of how, you know, the negotiation played out a little bit in there. But the long and the short of it is I got to the end of that process. I got to the end of that process and I sold it. Now, I got in my car, I drove up the motorway. I'll never forget that feeling. It basically changed my life. I knew that, I knew, I knew, I knew about four or five things. I knew I'd really helped Marty and I felt like I'd repaid the opportunity that I was given. Definitely. Because I knew that it was going to be a big opportunity for, for the business and, you know, it really helped them. I knew that financially I was no longer broke. You know, I wasn't a multimillionaire and I wasn't incredibly wealthy off the back of it, but I knew that it gave me some stability and it gave me a bit of momentum financially that I hadn't had for a long time. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence. I felt like a lot of hard work had just been repaid and that, you know, nothing really is impossible if you put your mind to it. The second house I ever sold was an eight and a half million dollar penthouse. So I knew that I was right. You don't have to start on one bedroom flats. But the biggest thing I learned from that deal was I was just in the middle of two incredibly successful people and I managed to broker a process, which gave me the confidence to look at football in a different way. I sort of started thinking to myself, well, do you know what? If you can do that, the only thing that's going to change is the zeros. So I used that as a bit of a stepping stone in my head to go, okay, Football, it's starting to become a little bit more realistic, starting to become a little bit more believable. And then off the back of that sale, I went on to have, you know, an incredible career in real estate. I, I wouldn't change any of it. It was fun. It was hard. It was exciting. It was everything in between. Went on to transact $150 million worth of residential real estate across the Melbourne market. Um, spoke at some conferences, um, had some laughs that, you know, just, you can't put a price on. Um, but ultimately, I walked away from the industry knowing that I gave it absolutely everything. I got everything out of it that I could. I met some unbelievable people along the way that will be friends with me and part of my sort of journey for the rest of my life. Um, and it all started from asking for an alarm code, working harder than, in my opinion, 99% of the market at the time. You know, I was doing 15 hour days, seven days a week. I was obsessed with learning, obsessed with becoming better, obsessed with finding a point of difference in the market, obsessed with um, trying to look at the things people aren't doing, not just what they are doing, and then adding value. Um, so it was, it was an amazing two and a half years. And, and then, you um, know, the I next want to quickly was, interject there. You said about adding value. You want to add value to what you said. 
And for me, coming into the piece and coming into your story at this stage was, I think about a year into your real estate journey, I'd come down to spend a week with you guys and basically see and test the waters whether I wanted to move to Melbourne and take my real estate career there. I remember the first time I ever met you, you know, I'd seen you in plenty of the marketing stuff. I sat across at, at Eugene's there at the Cottle and Coventry, having a brew with Marty. You walk in and I still remember we both shook hands and you go, I'm Fish, I go, I'm Brad. And you go, what are you doing here? And it was literally like that simple. What are you doing here? And I go, I'm just here to spend the week with you guys. And you go, no, I mean, like, what are you doing here? And I go, well, I guess I want to be great. And you go, good answer. And just walked out. And I was just like, <laughs> fuck, this guy's pretty straight to the point. And yeah. then I remember then coming and working. And, you know, I remember that week, we, we spent a bit of time together that week. And I could see that you had an insane work ethic. And I could see that you were so honed in on your goal that nothing was going to stop you. And you kept saying to me, those three words that you say consistently and is basically the backbone of everything that you do. Nothing is impossible. And I remember leaving and that was kind of the image of you in my head. But in some of those times where we'd sat down and, you know, I seen this fierce business competitor, this guy who was all in on achieving what he had to achieve for his clients and making those moves in his career. But behind it all, there was a bloke with really great intentions and a good heart. And that's when I knew that, whatever you went on to do, you're always going to do really well because your anchor was a foundation of a really decent human being. And I think that's the most important thing in anything that we do in life. And to then see you go on and, and do what you've done now and to follow your passion, for me, there was real joy in that because I felt watching you in the real estate space whilst you had fun and you enjoyed it and you were so successful, that's the thing that lacked was that, that passion, that truth of like you were back where you're supposed to be. And I feel like yeah. I see that in you now. And as, as a yeah, mate, that's really nice to see. I appreciate that. And you are right. Um, listen, there was, a, there was a time there in real estate where I did really enjoy it. And that's because there was a pace of life that it was giving me that, you know, intellectually was stimulating my brain. Um, I was working with very creative people. I was working with very ambitious people. I was working with very driven people. The energy at times was phenomenal. Um, and, you know, I've got to say, there were times there where it was some of the happiest of my life to date. I did, however, hit a massive brick wall at the end. Um, and I was incredibly miserable, which I've got no sort of hesitation in saying because it was probably one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. And I'm so glad I learned it at the age that I did. And it was when I was sat at a set of lights and, um, you know, only two years before I didn't have a pot to piss in, nothing, zero. I was in yeah. a one bedroom flat in St Kilda. Um, it was shit. My car was, you know, on the metric of society, shit. Um, I was scrounging around for coin. I was, you know, but in a weird fucked up way, I was almost happier then than what I was at the end of my real estate career. And I've had to go away and really sort of think about why that was, because I don't know if you've listened to a podcast recently um, with Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, I have. He's talking about his new book. Yeah, he's a very interesting guy. And it's funny because he's actually only recently articulated to me what it is I'm probably trying to, been trying to work out a little bit. But um, he said over the course of his life, what he tends to do is he goes back and looks at when he was his happiest and he looks at what he was eating, who he was hanging out with, commercially what he was up to, was he sleeping, what exercise was he doing? And he tries to work out what was going on at that time and then try and get as much of that happening again if he's not in a good place. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. So I tried to work out, you know, why when I was in an apartment I didn't like, when I didn't really have much money, when my car was on the metric of society, was it shit? And was things incredibly stressful? And I was, you know, working two jobs and it was all really hard. Why in a weird, convoluted, fucked up way was I almost a little bit more content and happy with myself at that point? And that's because I like the challenge. Okay? I like, I like the challenge. I like the, the uphill battle. And there's a saying, you know, the chase is better than the catch. Well, yes and no. I think you've got to enjoy the catch and you've got to 
explore what the catch is going to represent when you obtain it and what it is the catch is actually going to look like and feel like. Don't think too much into it because you want it to be organic when you arrive there. And listen, it's good to have a plan and you need to stick to that plan. I don't believe in a plan B. Always have a plan A and only a plan A. Um, plan B is subconsciously you telling yourself that plan A might not work. That's not the way to approach anything. But my point is... Um, I had it all in front of me. I didn't really know what was going to come. I'd never tasted any money before. I'd never been on the news before. I'd never walked into a cafe and three or four people knew who I was before in Melbourne. I hadn't really sort of experienced on the metric of society what is perceived to be on paper success. You know, what, what is the social scale of success in the modern climate? Well, it's, it's not even friends anymore. It's connections. You know, how many likes do you get? How many connections have you got? How much money have you got? What car are you driving? How big is your house? It's how you perceive, you know, it's, right? It's a very image orientated, materialistically driven <laughs> scale as to which what society is now scaled as, as success. So I got sucked right into that, right into that. Um, and why wouldn't I? I didn't know any better. I hadn't experienced it before. So I got to the end of my real estate career. I was sat in an expensive car, had an expensive watch, I was wearing expensive clothes, had a lot of money in my bank. Um, I could drive down a street called Beacon Hill Parade and drive past seven houses that I'd sold, all of which were above, you know, three and a half, four million dollars. Um, on paper, I was a very successful human being. I was incredibly miserable. And that's because I'd almost lost myself a little bit. I'd lost um, my way. I needed to get back to basics. I needed to feel challenged again. I needed to be less uh, materialistically orientated. I needed to be a less, less social media driven concept in terms of the way I was living. There were like all these things coming at me that were just like, this isn't you, this isn't you. Okay, but you know, why wouldn't you want nice things? But okay. Is there a cost in which you're going through in order to get, do you understand? It was like this massive Definitely. convoluted puzzle that I had to go away and work out. And I just freaked out. I was just like, I'm not happy and I need to do something about it. I'm not challenged. I need to do something about it. I don't want to spend the next five years of my life in real estate. If I stay now, if I stay, it's purely for financial reasons because I can bank myself this amount of money. I can get myself this sort of property over the next 12 months. I can get myself into this sort of car. I could have this sort of lifestyle. I could have this sort of comfort. And I just freaked out. And I was like, that's not what I want my purpose to be. That's not what I want to drive me. And if I stay now, it's for the wrong reasons. And it's purely financial. So I remember where I was. I was sat in the car at a set of lights. And there was no plan in doing it. I picked up my phone. I rang Fox. And I said, I need to come and see you. I sat down. And I resigned. And only a month before, I'd stood on stage at a conference called ARIC. I stood in a room full of people. And I said, listen, nothing's impossible. Chase your dreams. Nothing. I got off stage and I felt like a contradiction. So I thought to myself, do you know what? You should probably go do that. Yeah. Um, and that was the catalyst for that sort of thought process. So, you know, a lot of people said to me, what are you doing? Why? Or are you sure? Or, you know, look at the journey you've been on for the last eight years. You're at a point now where you can set yourself up and you can do, that's fine. I get all that. But, you know, I take constructive criticism. I listen to people. I love to learn but I would never listen to someone in terms of them fully influencing my decision unless I'd swap places with them. And I'm still yet to meet someone in life that I'd swap places with. So I internalized everything. Uh, and that's with the mistakes I've made as well. Even the mistakes and the absolute fuck ups that I've made over the course of my life, which has been a lot, mate, let's be honest. Like, you know, that's life. You, you live and learn. It is. Um, I wouldn't change any of it. And I had to really dig deep, really internalize things. I deleted all my social media. Um, I resigned, I sat down, I worked out my finances and I booked a plane for four weeks later. I had no business plan. I had no real idea of what I was going to do, but I knew that my purpose was in football. I didn't quite knew what it looked like. I didn't quite know where, but I knew it was football. And I knew that off the confidence I built over moving to London at 15, moving to Queensland, moving to Melbourne, getting into different markets, getting into real estate, and over a very short period of time, based off basic principles, work ethic, discipline, structure, attention to detail, cut the shit, get the job done. That's what I learned in the kitchen. That's what I then translated into real estate. Those principles. If I apply those principles in football, I've got a chance. And all I need is a chance. Give me a chance, I'll take it. So I left. 
And I still remember, I wrote the business plan of what I was going to do when I landed on the plane. It's a 24 hour flight from the UK, sorry, Australia to the UK. That's where I wrote the business idea. I didn't even have one. People were like, well, what are you going to do? Listen, mate, I'll figure it out. But what are you actually going to do? I'll figure it out. But mate, like, why don't you just stay another year? Work? Listen, I'll figure it out. But what are you going to do? I'll figure it out. It was coming at me from every angle. I didn't know, but I knew that I knew, but I didn't know, if that yeah. makes sense. You know intrinsically, right, that you you're trust on the yourself. Right path and that, you know, where per I always say that I think purpose drives progress. Yeah. And when you know you've got to do something because that's who you are and that's your makeup, you figure the shit out along the way. Correct. And it goes back to what you were talking about in terms of being a good person. I still remember a saying someone gave me, and it's, it's one of my favorite, favorite sayings that I've ever heard. If you were walking down a street and you saw someone lying on the floor, not moving, you'd keep walking. If you walk down the street and see someone crawling, you'll give them a hand up. Yeah. So I knew even if I came over here and I was just crawling, someone will help. Yeah. And I don't mean do you a favor. I mean, guide you. Listen, I can see what you're trying to do. Let me give you a hand. Because people who are ambitious, people who are driven, people who have the correct moral fiber and the right principles recognize people who are the same and they, they help when they can. Without, any, without wanting anything in return. So it pays in this world to just be a good human first. The rest is, you know, the cherry on the top. Definitely. And so you firstly set up the business, you create some great contacts. There is, I think, probably the most important thing behind what you're doing a real ethos that is once again, I guess, quite unique within the market that you're working in. And yeah. it's really not about moving money, but more so developing players, allowing players to grow, putting money back into grassroots, you know, supporting yeah. causes that are important to you, important to the foundations that you're building there in the UK and across the world now. Talk to us about that business ethos and how that was built. Well, basically, I reverse engineered the market in my brain. So, you know, again, you go back to wanting to be the best at anything you put your mind to. So I'm not a player. So I can't, you know, try and obtain a career like Cristiano Ronaldo. If I was a player, he'd be my benchmark. With all due respects, I don't want to be a referee. Um, the coaching pathway is not for me. If I got into coaching, I'd look at your Pep Guardiola, your Jose Mourinho, your Johan Cruyff, your Sir Alex Ferguson. I'd look at these people and go, okay, they're the benchmark. And I'd live my life trying to obtain similar success to them. So I sat down and went, okay, I'm not a player, I'm not a coach, I'm not a rep, I'm an agent. Well, who's the number one football agent on the planet? Jorge Mendes. Based on the level of transactions he does, based on the players he represents, based on his market clout, based on the clubs he deals with, based on the amount of languages he speaks, based on everything, he is the benchmark. But what I learned sat in that car being incredibly miserable about myself is I'm not money driven. Okay, I respect the pound note. I like the freedom that money gives you. And I like the taste of doing a deal. And I get all that. You know, we all want nice things. And listen, if you earn it, you deserve it. If you can afford a nice cottage in the country with an Aston Martin, which is my dream, if you can afford it and you've earned the right to afford it, by all means. But I think, and there's a saying, you know, Bill Gates has said, after a million dollars, it's all the same cheeseburger. So, you know, what actually enhances in your life after you've got a certain amount of wealth and you've got a certain amount of stability? Does your boat get bigger? Do you get an extra car? Does your watch get a little bit shinier? Does your house get slightly bigger? What are you actually enhancing? So I'd learned about myself. Do you know what? I'm not going to go into football and make that mistake again. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to spend the next 15, 20 years trying to accumulate as much wealth as I can, trying to appease a metric within society that I don't even want to try and appease. I need to look at this a little bit different. So I sat down and I said to myself, okay, what's the biggest commercial goal that I can set myself in world football? And it took me like three and a half weeks to try and figure it out. What's something that ticks as many boxes as I can? What's going to give me financial freedom? What's going to allow me to travel the world brokering some of the biggest deals in world football? What's going to allow me to experience different cultures? What's going to allow me to um, watch any games of football that I want? What's going to allow me to, you know, have a challenge and a commercial goal for the rest of my life that's going to fulfill me? What's going to give the family that I go on to build eventually um, a lifestyle that's going to be amazing for us to share? What's going to give me all of these things? What's going to also allow me to tackle social and economic issues in the world? What's going to allow me to use the platform that is world football, that's one of the biggest platforms in the world, to help? Do you know what? One day I'm going to run for presidency of the biggest sport on the planet. And I wrote down one day that my goal will be to run for presidency of FIFA. Now, I say FIFA because at the minute they're the governing body within the game. That might be non-existent by the time I get to a point where I'm even close to having the credentials of doing something like this. And do you know what? I may never get into a situation where I have the right to do it or that I've earned the right to do it. 
But what I've done is I've sat down and gone to myself, that, that's a challenge. That's the biggest commercial goal that my brain can possibly think of within the game. It ticks as many boxes as possible for me within the sport that I love. And if I do go on to achieve that, I know that whenever I sit down and call it a day, I've done something in this world that has allowed me to reach the absolute top of what I love most, which is football, but also in a way whereby I've accumulated all the things that you want out of life, but I've then got a platform to help and use the platform of football to tackle social and economic issues and leave the world in a better place than I found it. So that was the goal I then sat down and set myself. So that almost then becomes the, the ethos. Well, who do I need to turn into to achieve that? What do I need to represent to achieve that? What sort of relationships do I need to build to achieve that? What standard do I need to work to to achieve that? What do my daily habits need to be in order for me to achieve that? So that sets the tone. Yeah, definitely. Now, I'm 28 years of age. I'm sat here in an office, which, you know, some would say, you're at the start. Great. I like being at the start. I like the challenge. I'm probably going to be less happy the day I've done it. Yeah. But what I want to make sure is that I'm more fulfilled than what I was sat in that car at the end of my real estate career because I wasn't fulfilled. I was empty. Um, so that's set the benchmark for me. That's going to set the tone. That's going to be a massive factor in the decisions that I go on to make over the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 45 years. Uh, and that's now the standard I've put myself at. And I now need to grow into the person I need to become in order to achieve it. And that's what I wake up every day now dealing with as a pressure. And I'm excited to see it, man. I think you've got, you know, you've got all the ingredients to create something absolutely exceptional for yourself over there. I remember getting, like feeling my phone buzz in my pocket about two months ago now on a Sunday morning here in Australia. And it was a FaceTime call from you and we had a great chat. And I remember you said to me again, nothing's impossible. But the one thing I couldn't forget was a smile on your face. And you could just see that you're where you're meant to be you're doing what you're meant to be doing and I know that you'll figure it out no matter how long it takes or what challenges or hurdles are thrown in your way, you'll overcome them. And I'm just yeah. super excited, man. I, I can't congratulate you enough, but I can't be more excited as a mate just to see you doing what you love and to see no, the I appreciate it. Likewise. And, and Likewise. it's starting to happen. So I'm really excited, man. We've been talking for a long time. Um, I just want to get some last words from you. Uh, yeah, yeah. A message for everyone listening. There's plenty, you know, we've got a, a massive demographic of people between 32 and 18 that tune into this show, but a good bunch of them are sat in that middle sector where they're starting to make decisions in life that will heavily impact where they end up in the future. They're starting to set foundations and starting to figure out exactly what they want to do in life, whether that be, you know, measured by any metric, happiness, purpose, finance, whatever it may be, what would your advice be for them? Um, my advice, and listen, it's, it, it's, everyone has a different metric of what they want to achieve, um, but to them, that's their metric. So to them, what I want to achieve and how important that is to me, whatever their metric is of what they want to achieve is just as important to them. One of the things I'd say to everyone uh, at the minute in the current economic and social climate that we're in, COVID, um, the economic fallout that's going to come with that. Just the way society as a whole is now very much plugged in and I feel a little bit less connected, in my opinion. I think encourage other people, support other people, talk about your dreams, talk about your ambitions, talk about your failures, talk about your successes, share that. Um, it's, it's good. It, it helps other people. You don't know where people are at. Maybe it'll help you. Um, so one of the first things I'd say is to people out there, just be kind um, to anyone you come across who is on their own journey. Like I said, trying to achieve whatever their metric of their success is perceived to be. That's what they're on the journey to try and do. So why is that any different to yours? Leave the ego at the door when you wake up and you walk out the house. Just park it. Listen, you need an ego to a degree. Everyone's got one, but park it. When you're interacting with another human being, help if you can. Uh, that's the first thing. And um, I think one of the most important things, commercially, I'll go back to what I always say. Nothing's impossible. Absolutely nothing, right? Now, I don't say that lightly either because that's a very hard, 
it's a hard sort of ethos to live by because it means you're always sort of really challenging yourself. But the biggest thing I've learned is when things are really hard, you're very close to a breakthrough. When things are really hard, you're very close to having put the pieces of the puzzle together that you need to in order to maybe get that final piece of what it is you're trying to achieve across the line. Um, so for anyone out there listening, I suppose the one thing I'd say is have a look at what it is you're doing now. Is it what you want to do? If what you actually want to do is a risk, the risk is not to do it. Yeah. The risk the is risk. not to. The risk is to look back in 50 years and hate yourself for not doing it right. The scariest day of your life will be the person you are meets the person you could have become. Don't ever let that day happen. Now, to go into that a little bit deeper very quickly, why is the risk not to do it? Your life as it is, right? If you're not 100% happy or fulfilled or challenged or pushing yourself to potentially your limit as to what you feel you could achieve, it's a real shame to not take that next step and take that risk to try and achieve what it is that you ultimately would love to do. Now, 10 years ago, I was a chef. Seven years ago, I worked in retail. Three years ago, I was a real estate agent. Now I'm in world football, right? When I was a chef, did I know I was going to be a real estate agent? No. When I was a real estate agent, had I sat down and gone, wow, who'd have thought I would have been a chef? No. When I was in retail selling toasters, did I think I'd be sat at 28 years of age in the UK as a football agent with clients doing deals? No, right? So what I'm trying to say is life's got a funny way of guiding you if you, if you trust yourself and you back yourself and you trust your gut instinct and you sort of take that risk and open yourself up to the world and the, op and the opportunities that are out there. So like I said, the risk is not to because the absolute worst case scenario, the worst case scenario is that you do fail, right? Or it doesn't quite work out as you planned. But I promise you now, give you this advice for free, Everything you learn in the accumulation up to that failure or everything you learn during that failure or everything that you stand for whilst you're trying to attempt to achieve it, the people that you meet along the way, the experiences you have, all of that will far, far, far outweigh that feeling on the day when you quite haven't got there. It may then be the catalyst to redirect you in a way that you didn't think you needed to in order to get there, right? Or... You might then change direction a little bit, but it will be based off the fact that you took that risk and opened yourself up to the opportunities and built that accumulation of lessons along the way that puts you in a better position to then deal with your next chapter in life. Your alternative is you don't change, you stay where you are, and nothing ever happens. That's it. And that's so, a lesson again, there, isn't it? The risk is not to. Nothing's impossible. Back yourself, chase your dreams. And if you do that on top of being kind to people, again, you walk down the street, you see someone crawling up the road, you give them a hand up. Good people attract good people. Ambition attracts ambition. Drive attracts drive. So be a good person. Chase your dreams. Nothing's impossible. Respect the process. You're never above your current circumstance. The risk, my friend, is not to do any of that because your alternative is you stay the same. You don't grow. So for anyone out there, that would be, that would be what I'd suggest. And listen, I'm not saying it's easy. But there are some days where you're going to be waking up and going, wow, how have I got myself into this pickle? You've got yourself into that pickle because you're brave. And if you're brave enough to get yourself into the pickle, you've got the strength to get yourself out of it. Don't ever give up. Always keep moving. Be a good person. Respect the process. Nothing is impossible. Nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, it was my absolute pleasure to sit down with Ryan Fisher of now Total Football Group, but a man of many talents. Ryan, Thanks, where can man. everyone follow you? What's that? Where can everyone follow along on the journey? Um, so I think the first thing I'd like people to do is go to the website and just have a look at, I guess, you know, the foundation and the work that we want to do there. Um, obviously, it's important in the current climate to be on all the social media platforms. So I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm newly back on Instagram. Um, I'm not on Facebook. Um, and hopefully as things progress, if you guys all follow BBC Sport, you might see my name and my face popping up on there as well. But um, yeah, just the usual ways, mate. But um, again, I want to thank you as well. Congratulations on what you're doing. Um, I've got no doubt you'll carry on with this platform and be a great success. And um, it's nice to catch up with someone who, you know, only two and a half years ago, really, um, I was sat alongside in a real estate office chewing the fat and 
you know, it's it's crazy. I wonder where we'll be in another two and a half years. That's that's the exciting thing. Maybe on a beach in Spain, chewing the fat, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe, um, mate. Um, Just make sure you bring me some sunblock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for tuning in. It's always a pleasure. Give this a bloody absolute belter, five-star rating, raving review. Go follow this man on his journey. I'm sure you'll gain a whole lot of wisdom and enjoy the process along the way. Thanks for tuning in. It's always a pleasure.